Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Fred Allendorf. So Fred is a Regents Professor of Biology Emeritus at the University of Montana. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Washington and was a postdoctoral scholar in England and Denmark. So as an evolutionary geneticist, Fred applies the theory and molecular techniques of population genetics to problems in conservation. Now, over the years, he's published a few some papers on these topics. I kind of lost count, and maybe like 275. <laughs> uh, and he's also written a very influential book titled Conservation and the Genetics of Populations, which is used in classrooms uh, throughout the world, including here at OSU. So I was first introduced to Fred's research in graduate school as my master's of libraries in Moira Ferguson was one of Fred's PhD students. But I didn't have the opportunity to meet and interact with him until he arrived at HMSC in 2011 as the Laverne Weber Visiting Scientist. So it's great to welcome Fred back and his wife Diane to the Oregon coast. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Cinnamon, for inviting me to give the talk. And thanks, Kathleen, for the introduction. So I'm really happy to be here. And I hope, looking at the audience, I hope what I'm going to talk about isn't too genetic -y. So if I say something that doesn't make any sense, please stop and ask me. So I'm sort of obsessed right now with what really is genomics and how can we use genomics in ways that we couldn't use genetics before in terms of applying it to conservation. And as we'll see, I have some strong feelings about, about genomics. And so I think you know, one, of, one of the things that I feel pretty strongly is that, well, being a graduate student now in population genetics, I think, would be overwhelming. So I was a graduate student. I started graduate school in 1971. And I remember my major professor got his first calculator in 1972 that could take square roots and logarithms. And that was so exciting. And now, you know, to, to have to know, I mean, the theory is even greater. There's all the computer stuff, all the bioinformatics, all the technical stuff. So being a graduate student I, in population genetics now, I'm afraid is overwhelming. And I think what's sort of gotten shoved aside is understanding the theory in which one of the, the point of my talk today is it's really important to understand theory or you really can't do good population genetics or apply it to problems in, in conservation. So Kathleen mentioned this book, Conservation and Genetics of Populations. And so I, I guess I've always worked in this uh, sort of double world between basic science and applied science. And I felt really lucky doing this in conservation because I think some of the most important basic questions in evolutionary genetics are also some of the most important ones in terms of conservation, like adaptation, inbreeding, depression, and many, many other things as well. And what Kathleen didn't mention is that right now we're working on the third edition of this book. And so uh, we've added two co-authors. So the original well, the second edition was myself, Gordon Lucart from Montana and Sally Aiken from UBC. And now we've added uh, Margaret Byrne from Western Australia and Chris Funk from Colorado State University. And so one of the reasons I'm here is trying to, uh, is sort of a writing retreat to be able to focus and get, getting, getting a lot of this written. Because it's really, <coughs> genomics has just exploded. So th this edition came out, the previous edition was 2013. And it's just, genomics has just exploded since then. And trying to incorporate genomics into a book, which is already about as thick as I would want the book to be, without losing other things is really a difficult challenge. But that's one reason we added Margaret and Chris, who, I mean, I, I, who, who know the techniques much better than I do at this point in the bioinformatics. So um, three major points. First is the importance of understanding theory. Second is the importance of inheritance studies to construct linkage maps. And third, how some examples of how we can use genomic data and conservation and how it really is different than what we could do before in terms of genetics. So I really like this, this idea that if we're going to go out and do empirical population genetics, 
collect genetic data from natural populations, there's really three different things that we have to be very good at. So we have to go out and collect the data. So we have to know enough to, to collect the data that we can use. We then have to know how to analyze the data. And then we have to also understand the theory. And you know, there's not a sequence to this because really before we go out and collect data, we should be using theory to ask interesting questions so that we can answer those questions with the data. So I think it's important to be able to, to have all three of those legs of that stool if we're going to do empirical population genetics. And so for a source, there's really not, surprisingly, there's with all the genetic stuff coming out, there's not a lot of good books, newer books available on theoretical population genetics. So there's a number of old ones, but they don't really keep up with the new data. And so this book uh, by Joe Felsenstein is available online for free. And anybody who's really interest, interested in doing population genetics, I really recommend that book. And Joe has his own view of, the, of population genomics. So we have the same situation in population genomics. People have vast amounts of data and do completely half-assed things with it because they don't know any better. And I wish there were some way of persuading people that we need to train students in the development and properties of methods, and that means population genetics. And I agree completely with Joe. And this is, Joe has a little bit of a quirky sense of humor, and so this was, uh, he published his timeline of population genetics going from the 1950s to the, well, today in the future, this is probably about five to ten years ago, and so population genetics, rigor, none, some, lots, Teaching fades away. Hardy Weinberg invented. <laughs> and so, you know, this idea that, that people really have even forgot, even though there's theory out there in the literature, people have forgotten the theory and are now reinventing a lot of the theory. And so this is where I want to start my talk today, because when we do empirical population genetics, the first thing, the first analysis we do, almost always, is to test for Hardy Weinberg proportions, or we test for random mating proportions in a population. And a few years ago, Robin Wabel wrote this paper, similar frustrations to Joe and myself, constantly appalled to see people go through the motions of performing Hardy-Weinberg and linkage to equilibrium tests, reporting the results and then completely ignoring them, even when deviations are found. Few people know how to properly interpret multiple testing results, and most seem to have lost track of why it is essential to do these tests before using the data for other analyses. So I'm going to start with the, the most fundamental thing we can do in population genetics, testing for Hardy-Weinberg proportions. So this is a paper, and so as I said back in 1971, we're using Hewlett-Packard calculators and doing Hardy-Weinberg tests by hand. But now, when people are going out and collecting thousands of loci, it's impossible to do that. So I chose this paper partially because Chris, Chris Funk is a one of the co-authors co of the new edition of the book. This is a study that he published on uh, island foxes off of the coast of California. And there's a picture of a cute fox. And so rather than going out and looking at two or three, four or five loci, this was Chris and his colleagues went out and looked at basically 4,000 loci. And so the first thing you do is test is, do these loci fit what we would expect in a random mating population? And FIS is just a measure of whether it fits random mating proportions. And if FIS is zero, that's Hardy-Weinberg random mating proportions. So that's that line where the arrow is pointing. And if the value of FIS is greater, that means we have more homozygotes than we expected and or we have fewer heterozygotes. And if it's negative, that means we have more heterozygotes than we expected. So, you, so as Robin said, so how do we test to see whether this population is in Hardy-Weinberg proportions? So most of the value, so the, the mean in this population is right at this line. So it's just slightly positive. But we have values that range almost every, anywhere from one, which means all homozygotes. <clears throat> so all, well, some are actually minus one, which means all heterozygotes. 
So we can go out and do a chi-square test or some kind of statistical test, but how do we know we can't use a 5% criterion because we're doing 4,000 tests? So it's really hard to know how to, how to handle these kinds of data. So we can do this. So this is a simulation of a hundred, a same population size of 100 with the same mean FIS to get an idea of how much scatter we expect if the, if the variability we see up there is random. And you can see that looking at the top and the bottom, we do have much more scatter in the real data than we do in the simulated data. So we do have, it looks like there is some, something going on so that we have values, many values that are too high or too low. And I, I really don't know what we do with this. I mean, some people, have, some people filter the data and remove the loci that are too high or too low, assuming there's something wrong with those loci. But those loci may be the most interesting ones where there's something biologically interesting going on. So it's really, I don't know what the, what the answer is to this, other than at least we have to do these tests and at least try to understand the patterns that we see. So one confusion when people go out and test for hardy warnberg proportions is so FIS is an inbreeding coefficient as defined originally by, by right. So some people, when they go out and test a population, they call, they measure FIS and they talk about there being inbreeding or not inbreeding in the population. But actually FIS, as Dracard published many, many years ago, the word inbreeding, inbreeding coefficients are very confusing. And so FIS is a very different inbreeding coefficient, a very different inbreeding coefficient than pedigree inbreeding coefficient, which reflects how related our two parents were. And so sometimes people, like I said, estimate FIS and treat that as if it were measuring inbreeding in the population. But if we have a small population, but it's random mating, there will be a lot of inbreeding going on in that population. Because small populations, we have a lot of related individuals. So the mean pedigree F, the mean inbreeding of individuals is high. But the expected value of FIS will be 0, because all that is is a measure of whether there's random mating or not. It really is not a measure of whether there's inbreeding, per se, in a population. In fact, it gets worse than that. Because in very small populations, we expect there to be an excess of heterozygotes. Even though there's a lot of inbreeding in the population, we would expect a negative FIS value because of the fact just by chance there can be allele frequency differences between males and females. And the amount of the excess we expect is 1 over 2n, where n is the effective population size. So this is another island population of foxes from that same paper that I showed before. Remember, before the mean FIS was just slightly over zero. Now it's almost minus 0.4. So there's a huge excess of heterozygotes in this population. And the reason there is, I, I believe, is that this population has a very small effective population size. So it's a small island, not many foxes on it. And the estimated NE is 2.1. And using this value here, if the population size is that small, we expect 2.1. We expect a FIS value of minus 0.238. But actually, the FIS value is even much greater than that. So I could ask. Well, no, I will ask. So why do you think the excess of heterozygotes is even greater than we expect, given the effective population size. Any, any ideas? The population is evolving? Yeah, it's evolving, but I don't think that would change the... the so what, what we see is too many heterozygotes. And so the population is likely to be evolving, but I'm not sure how that in itself would give you a greater excess of heterozygotes than you expect. Could be a founding effect? Could be a founding effect, but again, I don't think that would affect the, the value of FIS today. Because the, founder, the founding effect would go away after a generation or two. 
concerned about the low side need to be in the heterozygous state to allow for viability. Of, uh, yeah, and you want to say that again? Uh, need heterozygosity to be slow side because uh, without that, uh, for whatever reason, there might be inviability without like lethal. The low side would be lethal in the homozygous. Yeah, maybe not lethal, but I think there's. It's probably because there is selection to, for increased heterozygosity. There's a lot of inbreeding in this population because the effective size is so small. And so we know the inbred individuals are, are less likely to survive. So I think what's going on is the heterozygotes are more likely to survive than the homozygotes. And that gives you a greater excess than you would expect. And this is a paper that came out a few years ago showing exactly that, not in foxes, but in wolves. So the population of wolves in Scandinavia, well, in uh, Sweden and Norway is very small, and they have a very high inbreeding coefficient, very high, a lot of inbreeding going on. So in this paper, they looked, they had, they knew what the pedigree was, so they knew how, what was what was the expected heterozygosity in each individual based on the pedigree, and what they found was that those individuals that were breeders had higher heterozygosity than non-breeders with the same pedigree F. So I think probably the reason why in the foxes the excess of heterozygotes is even greater is because of, of selection, probably viability selection against homozygotes, because homozygotes have greater inbreeding. So I'm just going to go through a number of different ways that we can get deviations from hardy weinberg proportions. So this is a paper that we, one of 275 papers we wrote. So Ann Marshall worked for Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and she had this, this is back in the old days, we were looking at proteins or allozymes. And Ann said to me at a meeting once, you know, we have this locus that we always have too many heterozygotes. I, I can't figure out what's going on. And I, I said to her, well, look at the males and females, because Chinook salmon have X and Y chromosomes. And unlike humans, there are a lot of genes on the Y. So in humans, the Y chromosome basically doesn't have any genes. But in Salmonids, the Y chromosome has pretty much all the genes that are on the X. And so I said, well, look to see if there's a difference between males and females to explain this excess of heterozygotes. So the FIS is minus 0.21, so there's 20% too many homozygotes. And when Ann did that, it turned out that almost all of the males, and this is one population out of, I think, about 80 that Ann looked at. This is the North Fork of the Nooksack River in Washington. Their males, almost every individual is a heterozygote. And so what's going on here is that there's a big difference in allele frequencies between the X and the Y chromosome. So males, Chinook salmon, just like humans, get one copy of the X and one copy of the Y. So almost all of the males are heterozygotes. So this is another explanation of why we can get out of Hardy-Weinberg proportions. So you can see why if we just willy-nilly do a, a chi-square test or some other kind of probability test and throw out loci with high or low values, we could be throwing out loci which are really valuable. And I always enjoyed doing inheritance experiments. So Anne actually had, uh, or Washington Fish and Wildlife, had a number of families. And so we did a number of crosses. So in this first family, the, the females, A and B just represent different alleles. Uh, the females were all AA. The male in this family was AB. And if you look, if you look, Every one of the males is a heterozygote, and all the females are homozygote. So it looks like, based on this, that the B allele is on the Y chromosome in this family, and the uh, A allele is on the X chromosome. So this is an example of sex linkage that will give you an excess of, of heterozygotes. And we turned out we only saw we had two recombinants out of 374. So the, this locus must be very near the region of the chromosome that determines whether individuals are males and females. And this 
so this is a recent, well, actually, this is not a paper yet. This is a, in bio. This was a preprint, uh, not even a print, what do you call it? An idea. An idea that somebody has been submitted <laughs> in bio. And this is, uh, I just, this is Garrett McKinney, who was working with Jim and Lisa C. Buck University of Washington. And what they found was that looking at different Y chromosomes, they looked at a number of SNPs, that the Y chromosome, differences in the Y chromosome was, was associated with differences in size of the fish and also age of the fish. So there's something going on in the Y chromosome that is affecting the age and, and, age, it's a, age and size in, in Chinook salmon. These are Yukon River, Western Alaska, and Cook Inlet, all showing the same pattern in terms of the, the effect of the four different Y chromosome types they identified and the, and the size. So sex, for lots of reasons, sex chromosomes are really interesting and really important to look at. And this was a paper that came out a year or so ago in uh, Trends in Ecology. Now, I guess molecular ecology was take that back. Making the point that when we go out and we collect 4,000 SNPs, one of the first things we should do, as well as testing for Hardy-Weinberg proportions, we should put the, the individuals into males and females and test for differences between males and females because there may be a lot of interesting things going on. So another thing that may explain the uh, deviation from Hardy-Weinberg is natural selection. And I heard an anonymous genomicist who was proud of the fact that he taught himself population genetics theory saying that if we, fill, if we remove the loci out of Hardy-Weinberg proportions, we're going to remove all the loci under selection. And this is, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, not true. And actually, we've known since 1959 when Lewontin and Cockrum did look to see how powerful it is testing for Hardy-Weinberg proportions, how powerful is that for detecting natural selection. And what they concluded was there's very little power. So even if there's strong natural selection, you're not likely to, to detect deviations for Hardy Weinberg proportions. And some fitness sets with very strong selection, you'll still be in Hardy Weinberg proportions. So it's really actually very difficult for natural selection to cause a deviation in Hardy Weinberg proportions at individual loci. So getting into the, the, the genomics part of the talk, so a, few, a number of years ago, we, uh, myself, Paul Hohenlow at the University of Idaho and Gordon Lucart, began to think about what, how is genomics going to change conservation? And to answer that question, you have to first decide what is population genomics? So I could ask people in here, but this is something that it's been one of my, my pet peeves that this is a paper, a, a bird paper, <laughs> where they define genomics. So we have genetics, and now we have genomics. So what, what's the difference? And so according to these people and many other people in the literature, genomics is genetics on steroids. So we're just going to look at more loci, and all of a sudden we're going to go from doing genomics or excuse me, genetics to genomics. But my view is that genomics is not just using more loci. Genomics is really conceptually different than, than genetics, or at least it should be. I mean, there's lots of value in looking at more loci, and it is more powerful. But I, I, I think it's not just looking at more loci, but just doing the same old test is not really worthy of calling it genomics compared to genetics. And so this is one of the things that we've been struggling with in the book. So Sally Aiken, one of the co-authors, tweeted this, I think, yesterday or the day before, asking people, well, what do we know now in conservation that we didn't know before when we could only use pop traditional population genetics? And, and most of the answers, I'd say 9 out of 10 of the answers, were that by looking at more loci, we have more power to detect differences between individuals and differences between populations. But I, from my view, 
I, I guess I, as I'll show you, I, I think genomics should be something which is different. And this was a definition, Paul Hohenlow again from Idaho, that Paul and I put together a couple of years ago. So I think when you're doing genomics, and people here may not agree with me, that you're, you should be sampling a map genome at sufficient density, you look at enough markers, that you can look at different regions of the genome. So you can detect regions of the genome under selection or reduced recombination. That is, instead of using a representative sample of loci to address the average effect of processes, population genomics describes variation in those processes in regions of the genome. And I'll explain in the next 15 minutes what I mean by that. And this paper by Paul and Bill Cresco and Susie Bassam, I think, was really the first population genomics paper. So they went out, this was now 10 years ago, and looked at sticklebacks, so there, these people were at the University of Oregon at that time, looked at sticklebacks, and so they were looking at sticklebacks that become adapted to fresh water. So there are two ocean populations here, Resurrection Bay and Rabbit Slough, which are marine populations, and then they looked at three lakes, Boot Lake, Bear Paw Lake, and Mud Lake, that were freshwater populations that they don't go to the ocean at all, and freshwater sticklebacks evolve very different morphologies, very different behavior. So they were interested in what are the genes responsible for these ad adaptations to freshwater. And so they looked at 45,000 SNPs. And so this is sort of a mind-blowing, like I said, this is really the first study in population genomics. So each blip here is value for FST, which is the amount of divergence between the samples or between the populations. Each gray and white line are different chromosomes, and the, these chromosomes are just uh, put on here arbitrarily. So 400 megabases is just the size of the genome. And so if you look at the top line, that is the FST, the genetic differences between the two ocean populations. And you can see it's basically zero with a couple of little, little blips. So almost all, all those are, at least the mean is zero. But if you look at comparing the difference between each of the three freshwater populations to the ocean populations, which are combined because they have no difference, these are the values of FST. And what we see here is the mean is about 0.1 rather than zero. But more importantly for the question they were asking is we have these spikes, which indicate regions of the genome under selection that are thought to be responsible for the adaptation to fresh water. And the crucial thing is here that these spikes all seem to occur in about the same place in each one of the three different lakes. And these lakes are thought to be independent, independently derived from the marine population. So it looks like there's been parallel adaptation for genes in these particular regions. And when they looked at the, the known map based on morphological studies, these do correspond to things like plates and other things that are known to be the differences between the freshwater and, and marine fish. So this is a way that they went out and identified those regions of the genome associated with this adaptation, which you cannot do just by looking at many loci without having a map. Can Questions? Just a quick clarifying question sure. About this. So Please. 45,000 SNPs within the genome. Yeah. How many individuals are they using? Like how many comparisons amongst individuals to do this kind of analysis? Back then, it was I think it was less than 20. So, I mean, they were really the first people to do it, and that's one of the problems. You can't look at 45,000 SNPs and 200 individuals. So this was, I don't remember the sample size here, but I'm pretty sure it was 20 or less. I think now people use much larger sample sizes. <coughs> so the, uh, the Fox study that I talked about before, they were looking at sample sizes between 50 and 100. But these are very small sample sizes. So I think one of the most, to me, one of the most exciting areas where genomics can inform conservation is this box here, which is inbreeding depression. 
So these red boxes represent areas where we thought were we couldn't do before with genetics, but we can do now with genomics. So now we do a much better job of getting at adaptive variation, outbreeding depression, local adaptation, and inbreeding depression. So the next part of my talk is going to be about inbreeding depression. And, and this is a case where it's really, to me, is really mind-blowing that, so this was Ari Fisher who invented most of statistics or much of statistics, who was a genius, developed a lot of the theory in population genetics. So in 1965, he thought about inbreeding depression and wrote this book, which I don't recommend because there's nothing that Ari Fisher wrote that any other human can read. I remember when I was a grad student, I remember trying to read Fisher's classic book. What's the name of his classic book? So the main, Genetical Theory of Natural Selection. You know, it was supposed to be the book. And I tried reading that, and I just couldn't read it. And then I realized each paragraph is about a page long. So he was a genius in mathematics, but he was not a very good writer. But it's amazing to me that in 1965, he thought what he called a, stra a strand theory, which is basically what Paul Hohenlow, that paper looking across the genome, he developed a theory for not looking at individual loci, but he developed theory for strands of chromosomes. And so this was most of population genetics up until well, R.A. Fisher was point theory. So we had these beans in a bag, and we're pulling these beans out of a bag. But strand theory recognizes that these little beads are on a strand, which is a chromosome. And by looking at the patterns of the beads on the chromosome, we get a lot more information. And that's, it's not just more loci, but it's having a map so we can look at these strands along the chromosome. And so historic, historically, when we are interested in inbreeding depression, what we do is we look at a pedigree, and this is another bird. And so, hmm? I know, in conservation biology. It, Guam rail, right? Well, it's a generic pedigree. Yeah, but the paper was Guam rail. Yeah. And so we, we look at, by looking at a pedigree, you can, and how inbred an individual is, you can predict how homozygous he is because of inbreeding. But this is not a good way to do it anymore. And now, by using strands or genomic measures, it's a much more powerful way to measure inbreeding or inbreeding depression. And so the strand theory basically is this drawing on the left where we're looking at, we have different colors represent different origin of chromosomes. And so up in that top, we have a crossover event between those two chromosomes. So the chromosome that is passed on is this combination of these two colors, whatever they are, down here, then we have another crossover event, and then we have this chromosome down here, which has three different colors. So strand theory is following these strands, these regions, which are derived from the same ancestral chromosome. And Marty Cardos was a grad student with myself and Gordon Lucart. He's now a postdoc at Montana. So a lot of the things in the next five slides are work that are based largely on stuff that Marty has done and Marty is going to start working at uh, NOAA NIMPS in Seattle in, in May of this year. So he just got a job working with him. And so there is, Ari Fisher began this in 65, but Elizabeth Thompson and others have developed this theory. And this is, again, the example of what we're talking about in terms of strand theory. So what Chapman and Thompson did was they said, well, let's, found a new population and think that each chromosome is unique and keep track of that chromosome by different colors and then follow, after we have meiosis and recombination, follow how those chromosomes are recombined as we talked about here where we have this due to recombination and then look to see what proportion of the genome 
we expect to be identical by descent because an individual is inbred. Now, identical by descent means that the same, this chromosome derived from a single chromosome in a common ancestor of the individual's mother and father. So here's an individual, the two chromosomes. And if we look along here, I'm, I'm colorblind, so these things are always challenging to me. But places where we have the same color, that means that they are derived from the same ancestral chromosome. And this black and white up here, regions that are white represent regions that are identical by descent. So we can see here is identical by descent because of these two are the same, these two are the same. Here the chromosomes are different, and that, that's shown as black. So we can look at the proportion of the, the strand or the chromosome, which is identical by descent. And we, if we understand meiosis and rates of recombination, we can develop a theory to try to understand this. And here's a simple example. So here we have a pedigree, and we're, this is the common ancestor. So that male is the father. So this is the individual we're interested in. This is his father. This is his mother. And so the male passed on these chromosomes. This individual got these chromosomes from his father and his mother. This individual got these two. And then this individual is, has these pairs. And here we have those regions, again, which are identical colors, which represent they originated from the same chromosome. So those are identical by descent. Those are regions where an individual is, is homozygous because of the fact that they were derived from the same chromosome just two generations back. So except for mutations, those regions will be completely identical to one another. And if we look at the whole genome and count up over a whole genome, the number of these, the lengths of these tracks, we can estimate what proportion of the genome an individual is homozygous because of inbreeding. <clears throat> and this is, if we look at a number of markers, this is what we see. So this is work in Hans Elgren's lab, and Marty was a postdoc in this lab. So this is a Swedish collared flycatcher. And so this is, again, the chromosome. This is one chromosome from 0 to about 80 megabases. This is the heterozygosity value in the y-axis. And you can see that m most of the regions, most of the loci individual is heterozygous. But there are these regions where the individual is almost completely homozygous. <clears throat> so this region right here is a region which is homozygous, which is thought to be a region which is identical by descent because of, because of inbreeding. And we can do this now. We can do this in a whole population. So this is looking at a population. This is, again, well, this is one chromosome, three different individuals. And we can see in the middle individual, from the top individual, there's no obvious reasons which are identical by descent. This individual, there's one, one fairly large one. And this individual, there's two regions, a large one and a small one. And so the, the length of these regions is also important because the more recombination will make, if there, once there is a region, recombination will make that region smaller and smaller. <clears throat> so these are three different this is a population where there has been inbreeding. And after two generations of inbreeding, this is the size of the, the tract of homozygosity or identical by descent. And so the mean is the same in all of these. The, the mean amount of the regions identical by descent. But the more generations, re recombinations make these regions smaller and smaller. So unlike just look, we can all not only estimate how homozygous an individual is, we can estimate how far back in time the inbreeding event had to take place. And this was a nice paper published now two years ago, <clears throat> looking at these are regions. So these dark areas are regions which are identical by descent. And by looking at, this one is easier, 
So these are three different uh, scenarios of demography. So on the y-axis, we have number of regions which are, we have runs of homozygosity. And on the x-axis, we have the total length. So if we have recent inbreeding, we expect fewer large regions that are identical by descent. If we have a small population, just a small effective population size, we expect to see more regions of homozygosity, but they are going to be small, they're going to be, they're on average, they're going to be smaller. And if we have a combination of a small population with inbreeding, we, we have something that looks like that. So by looking at these patterns of how many regions they are, there are and how large they are, we can get an idea of how inbred an individual or a population is or how long ago the inbreeding event took place. And I think one of the things that surprised most people that didn't read R.A. Fisher because they couldn't understand him, so these are a bunch of, of full SIDs. So full SIDs should be homozygous over 25% of their genome because of inbreeding. And these are two different cases with two different size genomes, a small genome up top, the big genome in the bottom. And on the average, you can see the, re the amount, the average region identical by descent, or F, is about 0.25, which is what we would expect. But we, there's tremendous variability. So with a small genome, we can have some individuals that are homozygous over 10% of the genome and some 40%. So, and I think m myself and other people really were surprised how variable this is. And it also is, explains why it sometimes it's been difficult to detect inbreeding depression. And so Ari Fisher knew about this 35, 55 years ago. And he pointed out they all have the same coefficient of inbreeding, but individuals have greatly differed in their extent of homozygosity. And so in understanding inbreeding depression in a population, pedigree F is not a very accurate measure of how much inbreeding is actually, how inbreeding is affecting that individual. And these kinds of genomic ways of looking at it are much more powerful. And this is a paper on the Scandinavian wolves I was talking about. This is just a number of different chromosomes. And again, so this is a highly inbred population. Individual down here is homozygous or identical by descent over half of its genome. So we can see lots of big chunks of homozygosity. Again, heterozygosity is up here. Homozygosity is down here. And so uh, getting to the question again of sample size, now we it's possible to look not just at a few individuals, but look over large individuals. I think they actually looked at 100 individuals. They basically sequenced the entire genome of all the wolves in Scandinavia. And so now, even though these individuals have a similar inbreeding coefficient based on the pedigree, their actual amount of inbreeding varies quite a bit. And this is one example of why that is important. So here's a case in uh, red deer where they looked for, tried to detect inbreeding depression. And using pedigree, there was no evidence of inbreeding depression. But by looking at genomic measures of proportion of the genome identical by descent or runs of homozygosity, there was substantial inbreeding depression. So th this is a much more powerful way to detect inbreeding depression than we could before. We just had, we didn't use a, a, a genome, and we didn't look at strands of chromosomes. So not only can we look at homozygosity, we can also look at heterozygosity. So this is also a powerful way to get at migration or hybridization. So we sort of turn the whole thing on its head so rather than looking at homozygosity, we now look at heterozygosity. And these are called migrant tracks. These are regions of the genome where individuals are heterozygous because they have two chromosomes originating in two different populations. And so this is a powerful way not only to detect hybridization or migration, 
but also to get an idea, just like before, by looking at how big those regions are, we can estimate when the hybridization took place. So this is probably the most well-known example of this. So, uh, you know, looking around the room, it looks like everybody has about 2.8% Neanderthal. <laughs> but, so this guy 45,000 years ago also had 2.8% Neanderthal. So this was a fossil that was aged to be 45,000 years old. And they looked at the regions of the genome in that individual that were migrant tracts or heterozygous because of hybridization and compared it to individuals alive today. And based on the length of those regions, they indicate they determined that hybridization between humans and Neanderthal happened about 10,000 years before this individual lived. So not only do we know that we have 3% Neanderthal, but also it looks like this was about 55,000 years ago. So this goes back to my comment before about the importance of theory. So this is Swante Pabo, and this is a really good book. I, I recommend any uh, graduate student in population genetics reading that book. He talks a lot about doing science as well as other things that probably shouldn't be in there, but talking about asking important questions and getting the importance of the quality of data is really strongly emphasized in that book. And so when, so Svante was very good at, so he started out trying to get DNA from mummies and ended up using, trying to go back and look at Neanderthal. So he's always interested in looking at ancient DNA. And he was very good at getting the data, but then he realized that he couldn't analyze the data without knowing a hell of a lot about population genetics theory. So he went out and recruited people like Monty Slatkin and Rasmus Nielsen and other population geneticists trying to help him understand the data. So I think we're OK time-wise. So some of my own, this is my third part of my talk, talking about the importance of genetic maps. And people in here, at least, at least there's a one person in here that works with Salmonids, know that Salmonids are tetraploid, which I, to me, has both been a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because by polyploid, I mean they have their entire genome was duplicated somewhere about 50,000 years ago. So white, or excuse me, grayling, whitefish, and salmon and trout all have twice the number of genes that we do. And trying to study this genome duplication event is, has been really interesting, but it's also a mess when you're trying to work with salmonids because you have so much gene duplication, which make a lot of the standard techniques not work very well. I don't know if I want to glaze everybody's eyes over by going through all that. It would be better to have time at the end. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just cut that part out. So there, there, especially working with Salmonids, it really is important to have a genetic map and to understand the, the importance of duplication in, in Salmonids. So this is an example of applying genetics slash genomics to natural populations, trying to understand local adaptation. So this is work done by Christina Ramstead, who is a grad student of mine, who's now at the University of South Carolina in Aiken. So she looked at Lake Clark in Alaska, and she was looking at a number of sockeye salmon populations in Lake Clark. And so each one of these ovals represent a sample. And she looked at fish, so she looked at both glacial streams and clear streams, so streams that were fed by glaciers, so they were very milky. I have a slide in a minute. And she also looked at populations that were spawning in lakes, or the shore of the lake or small lakes, and in rivers. So she was interested in looking at local adaptation in these different spawning habitats. So as you can see, Lake Clark is a tributary of Lake Iliamna which is where all the work the university, a lot of the work the University of Washington has done. And so she looked at 11 microsatellite loci. So this is sort of classic population genetics. 
And what she found was that these populations were very nearly, well, not identical, but there was very little divergence between these populations. So all these samples are, if you just look at over the whole genome, on average, they're very similar to one another genetically. But she was interested in local adaptation. And so, as I said, there was glacial streams that looked like that and clear streams that looked like that. And probably sexual selection and behavior and lots of other things that are going on are going to be very different in a glacial habitat compared to a non-glacial habitat. And so Christina went out and she had noticed that sometimes you came across these sockeye salmon which were pink rather than the, the classic red. And so when she looked at glacial versus non-glacial streams, she found out that the, nine, the clear streams, the non-glacial streams, she never saw an individual that was pink. But in the glacial streams, about 3% of the males and two-thirds of the female were this pink color. So, so she was interested, and so it looked like this was a local adaptation. There's a much higher frequency, assuming this is genetic, which we don't know, but we, we believe it is, that there's a much higher frequency of the pink allele in glacial streams. And so the question, one question would be, well, why would that be the case? Well, I think as every, most people in here know sockeye salmon, they're, they're, they're also called red salmon, and this red coloration is really important in terms of sexual selection. So Chris Foote, this is a slide from Chris Foote, who uh, did this work at the University of Washington. So Chris was interested in sexual selection and this red coloration in, in pink salmon. And so Chris was interested in trying to build these models of sockeye salmon to see how males and females reacted to different, different sized fish with different colors. And then one day, by mistake, by accident, they threw in a piece of red plastic that didn't look like a fish at all, but all the males went crazy and went running over and dropped their sperm on top of this red piece of plastic. So it turns out that they didn't care what, it, what the plastic looked like. As long as it was the right color, it evoked this response in terms of sexual selection. And so th this red coloration is, 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 comes from carotenoids, which the sockeye salmon get from their diet. And it protects his tissues from oxidative damage. It helps regulate the immune response. It can't be synthesized de novo, so they get it from their diet. And it's also thought to be an honest signal of fitness. And so Christina thought, well, if the females aren't putting the red pigment, the carotenoids, into their skin color, what are they doing with it? And so she went out and looked at the color of the eggs. So here we have females from the non-glacial streams, and that's the mean color in the score in terms of the amount of red. And so this was the mean in the clear streams. This is a, the glacial stream. These are the red females, are exactly the same as the red females from the clear streams. But the pink females, they had sub substantially greater pigmentation in their eggs. So it looked like there was some kind of a trade-off going here that the females, rather than putting this, the red pigment into their, their body, they were putting it into their eggs, supposedly to increase the probability of survival of their eggs. So this was very nice. I, I was pretty excited about it. But we have no idea you know, where in the genome this comes from. But the, another study, so as well as I said, there's also the beach spawners versus river spawners. And stream spawners tend to be this more fusiform shape, much better at keeping their position in the water, either in the stream or in the river, where these beach spawners tend to have much bigger bodies. So these are two pictures of Christina's fish. This is a beach spawner and a stream spawner. So the question is, are, is this also, is this a genetic difference between them? And this is work done by Wes Larson and Martin Morton Limborg in the Siebes lab at the University of Washington, where they went and looked at river and, and beach spawners, again, trying to look at this body size. And what they found, now this is genomics, 
So they were looking at the genome, 4,000 centimorgans. So centimorgan is just a measure of recombination. So this is, again, looking across each gray and white area of different chromosomes. They found out that there is this region right here. So these are the FST values. So what this shows is that this is a region of the genome where the thin, the fusiform, and the broad plate size fish differ substantially. The FST value is almost 0.4 compared to a mean of about zero. And so this it looks like the region of the genome associated with this local adaptation is encoded by genes right here in this region. And that is seems to affect body depth. And it turns out that, that there's a gene within that region, which is the same thing which affects the obese, obese mouse. So it's thought, they don't know for sure, but it's thought to be that this deep body sockeye gene is the same as the obese mouse gene. So this is taking genetics, trying to find local adaptation, looking at it from a genomic perspective so we can see where the region is that's associated with that. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. But, and also, you know, I hate people who write papers with titles and don't answer it. So, yes. <laughs> And I spared you the most genetic -y part of it. So I think that worked out well. Could you share your thoughts on, um, you know, a lot of people are they're doing genomics because they want to find conservation units that you can't detect with fewer markers. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on the meaningfulness of conservation units that can only be detected with really, like, thousands of markers and have a significant but low magnitude. Well, that's a, that's a, as you know, that's a really hot question right now. And I think there's a meeting going on at NIMPS right now or last week or next week trying to answer that, that question. And I guess my, the short answer is detecting those regions, like in the sockeye example, is very important. But I don't think they should be used to identify different conservation units. I think conservation units should reflect genetic divergence over the whole genome. And they should tell you what the, your units are that you're trying to manage, because that tells you how much gene flow, the sizes of the populations. But understanding those regions which bring about important differences in life history are important, but they shouldn't, you sh they shouldn't be used to, de to determine different conservation units. So let's say that you are looking at Chinook salmon, and you find one gene that's responsible for age at sexual maturity. So you say, OK, well, these are two different conservation units. Well, then what happens? You find another gene which has a major effect on size. Do you split those two up into four? And so I don't like that information is important and interesting and valuable for conservation, but I don't think it should be used for defining units. So what, sh what should be used to define them? Well, there's a, one of those 275 papers. Chris Funk wrote a nice paper in Trends in Ecology and Evolution that talked about using genomics for defining conservation units. So my view is that initially, the, the, the major thing you're looking at is the amount of divergence at neutral loci over the entire genome. And then on top of that, you use the information you may have for adaptive genes. So what would you use? Neutral markers. Yeah. And to give a simple answer. Yeah. Well, I don't. I know. What do you, <laughs> well, I mean, you're. It, I, you know, one of the things. You know, I know I'm an old guy, and old guys always say this, but. Looking at no, no, it's amazing to me how much of the work that we did in the '70s and '80s with a handful of Alzheimer's loci. We get the same answer today. In general, yes, we have much more power now. So if we want to detect like small differences, we have much more power. But looking at a few alizymes, you know, was was really helpful for, for many ways. No, it, it was. Although for birds, it kind of sucked. Well, it's because birds don't have any genetic variations. But yeah. <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, that's not. A, I mean, it's true. They 
have much less genetic variation. Well, based on how many papers we're having to incorporate in the third edition, there has been. <laughs> but I, I think has the data been analyzed correctly. Some of it has, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff out there. So that uh, tweet that Sally Aiken put up yesterday, I mean, there's very she got a lot of replies, but I think very few of them were really rep representative of a genomic revolution. So I think the example there, I mean that, that's one, being able to identify these major these genes with major effect. That's that's really different than we couldn't do that before. But I think a lot of it is just it, it sounds better to say you're doing genomics than you're doing genetics. So you had a question back there? Yeah, just uh, I'm trying to understand something. Um, so you have that uh, slide with the I think it's the cool study and they looked at six point seven Yes. So um, I can't remember. I know I was supposed to yeah, do something with that to go through. Those are all in genes, right? <laughs> we don't know. I mean, they're the random. They're they're random single nucleotide polymorphisms. So based on the fact that genes are only two percent of the genome, most of them are, are not in genes. Yes, if we're, if we're, well, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's not putting DNA. I think it's, it's for, so most, for most questions, I think the non coding DNA is more interesting and more informative. Potentially, right? It's no, it is. Like, it just simply is. Because if we look at genes under selection, if we look at neutral genes and we see, so let's say we want to look for regions of homozygosity. We need neutral markers because if there's strong selection, we won't be able to see those signals. If we want to see how different two, po how much gene flow is occurring between two populations, we want to use neutral markers because if there's selection, there ca that can bring about differences even though the populations are isolated or, or connected. So we need to understand what's going on in the genome. Basically, we need neutral markers. And then on top of that, look at regions which are under strong selection. But we can't, I mean, the neutral markers, I think, are sort of the, the fundamental thing we need to look at to estimate inbreeding, to estimate gene flow. I know that sounds, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it, some people have argued, well, we want to look at the regions which are adaptive, because they're the ones we're really interested in. But it's the comparison between the, we, the neutral and the adaptive that we really need, I think. Are genomic rearrangement solutions insertion significant in population genetics theory? Well, certainly one of the things we found out is that inversions are. So a lot of the, uh, the a lot of the major genes, so uh, age of sexual maturity in Atlantic cod, it's known for a long time there's a single region of the genome, and it turns out that's a huge inversion. So there's lots of genes inside that. So these regions, so an inversion is a part of the genome where we take a chunk of chromosome and turn it around and put it back in. And once that happens, there's no longer, there's greatly reduced recombination. So it's like we have these super genes, which are many genes linked together in this inversion. So they've turned out to be much, much more important than, than we knew before. Deletions and insertions are um, not as much, but certainly inversions are. I want to say thank you.